Strengthening and holding on to genuine faith is our theme for this semester. Last semester, we were handling the theme of leadership. Leadership for ourselves as of ourselves as individuals, leadership in our ministries, leadership in our families, leadership in the Church of Christ. And we learned that as leaders, we ought to leave behind a legacy. A legacy that glorifies the Lord, and everyone can be able to say, yes, there was a leader here, and they left something positive along their trail. And that's the desire of God, that each one of us would leave behind a legacy for his kingdom. Family itself is a ministry, and I want to thank God for what he has enabled us to do. But we know that we cannot do any, anything on our own, whether it is in leadership, whether it is in our families, whether it is in our faith. It is the strength of the Lord alone that enables us to do anything well. As we did sing in various songs here, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. When we wait upon the Lord, he gives us strength to do things well. But as we look at what our role is as a church and what God calls us to, this semester we shall be looking at our role in evangelism. It is the semester of evangelism, bringing men and women into the fold of God through our ministry, through our faith. And we cannot do that unless we are strengthened internally. We shall reflect on the, on the passage you read from Revelation chapter 3. Those seven, six verses that we read from Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. It's a message from Christ himself to this church that seems to be having some issues they are trying to grapple with. It is a struggling church. You could actually say it is an ailing church because he is saying this church outwardly looks to be alive. There's a lot of activity happening there, but inwardly the church is dead. Let me remind us of, of the definition of death. Death is a separation. A separation of body and soul. Once the two are separated, then we say the person is dead. And I'm told that scientifically, when someone is dead, the blood separates from the water. You know the water is, what percentage of water is the body? The, the, the body, how, how, which percentage? 75% water. So they say, although we cannot see it clearly, but when someone dies, the water separates from the blood. The blood, the red blood cells get separated from the liquid that carries them, which is water. And therefore, death is a separation, both physical and spiritual. Body and soul are separated. Water and blood, red blood cells are separated. And in the spiritual sense here, one's connection with God is broken. We become separated from God. And so, the church in Sardis is said to be a dead church, a church which has got separated from God. Outside, there is something that looks like faith, expressed in various ways. The people, I think, still go to church every Sunday, the wardens still do their work of cleaning the place and want to thank them for that. The choirs are still singing and probably even better. Probably even miracles are still happening within the church. And the lame are walking and the blind are seeing. And the barren get their children and so on and so forth. The offertories are still brought. But the motive of doing all those things seems to be faulty. 
People do things to be recognized by man. They give their money so that they can be appreciated. They do good works so that they can get favors somewhere else. When evil abounds, nobody is speaking. I don't know whether the church in Uganda does not sometimes reflect the definition, the, exp the, 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 ex the expression of the, service, of the church in service. In the political arena, we have seen things go wrong and we have largely kept quiet. People do things that are unimaginable. You begin to attack people without cause. Civilians are attacking government without cause and we keep quiet. Government attacks people without cause or with a force greater than would have been required for a response and we keep quiet. And yet in in, on Sunday, the church is full of people praising the Lord and talking about truth and justice. Jesus is said to the church, saying it to the church in Sardis, you have the reputation of being alive, but actually you are dead. Your works have not been found worthy before the Lord. Yes, you do the works, but your motive of doing them is wrong. They are not guided by the Spirit of God. They are not guided by love. Because the scriptures tell us that anything that is done outside love is like filthy rags. Our righteousness without Jesus Christ is like filthy rags. And so when we don't do, any, when we do anything that is not in love, we are not doing any righteousness. And this is what is happening in the church at Sardis. Their love for the God is no longer sincere. But then he tells us that there is an opportunity for them to turn back to him. That yes, they have cheated one another. Like many of our Christians are in public offices. On Sundays they are in church. They probably even give their tithe. Although the church of Uganda, we are very guilty because we don't bring the whole tithe. True or false? How many of us offer the truth, a, a, a real tithe? Of course, you are supposed to give it in secret. But it's a challenge to us. We give, but we don't give the whole thing. And we are guilty of that before the Lord. But the Lord is saying, there is an opportunity for you. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Their deeds do not tally with their faith. But he is saying, come back. Remember where you have fallen from. And rekindle that little faith that still remains in you. We can't trash it out that your work is nothing. You do some work because you know there is someone you are working for. But he is saying you are not fulfilling the whole law as he, as he, as he requires. And he's, he is likening it to sleep. That's why he says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die out. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. Yes, they are doing well, but it looks like for the church in Sardis, they have done a paper, but not satisfied the examiner. So he's saying, you're going to have a retake. A retake is an opportunity for us to start again, to have a new try. At the time I went to university, when you failed three subjects, there was no retake. You would just be sent away from the university. I remember colleagues who entered within the university and the colleague failed three papers and they said, your chances are over. We used to have what we used to call the Dark Friday at Makere University. Dark Friday was the, the day when the results for veterinary medicine and, and human medicine came out. 
that was a dark Friday. Because in veterinary and the other medicine, there always were people who could not make it, who were not given an opportunity for a retake. They had to be disqualified and go out. And when you are disqualified at that time, you didn't have an opportunity to do another program. For us here, if you cannot make it in, in medicine, there can be opportunity for you to say, can I go to agriculture? And the university will allow you. But that time, it was never the case. There was no opportunity. But the Lord is good and gracious. He gives retakes. Hallelujah. <laughs> and allows you to start again. And for him, he forgets your past and does not even, say, does not even indicate that it was a retake. If you deserve a first class, you will still have it. And, and those who have a first class, will all, all, the first class is entering into heaven. All those who have retaken and passed and lived a righteous life for, before him will inherit his eternal kingdom. God is not like us. The Bible tells us that he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Hallelujah. He's a gracious Lord. But we cannot take him for granted. We have to listen to what he tells the church. Verse 5 is a call to remember what we have received from the apostles, from, the, from our parents, from our teachers, from colleagues who have brought the word of God to us. He is saying, remember what you received. Remember those who sowed the seed of faith among you, who taught you about the repentance and the forgiveness of sins, and repent and be renewed. Acknowledge. God acknowledges also the few who still stand. In verse, so, in verse 4, he tells us, there are still some among you who are still the, walking the way of genuine faith. Those ones I shall clothe with white robes and they shall share with me in the eternal kingdom. So sometimes you may feel that your work is in vain or your faith is in vain for you seem to be struggling alone. Especially some of you who may come from a family where you are the only believer and you feel abandoned and forsaken. Don't worry. The Lord realizes that there are a few. A whole church may be discredited either for immorality or for corruption or for anything bad. What some people say do is to say, I will never again go to that church. But the Lord is saying, he recognizes you. Even if you seem to be a soul voice out there crying in the wilderness, the Lord realizes that you are there and he keeps your reward for you. Hallelujah. But not only does he keep a reward for you, he puts you there so that you might be a light in that place. What was the problem with the church at Sardis? This church was, was false. It was putting up an outward appearance of good works, an outward appearance of faith, just like Jesus castigated the Jews for their religious shows. Like us, the priests, we put on these robes, and then you stop there and think, that's your righteousness. And for the Jews, the Pharisees, they had to even carry the laws written, inscribed on some clothes and wearing them on their faces and on their arms to show that they are righteous. Whenever they went to the temple, they first washed their feet. And they prayed the many times that were required. I, I think this is expressed more by the, our Muslim brothers still do a lot of that. The ritual washing that used to be done in the Jewish religion. But Jesus is saying that outside the external expression of their faith is not enough for you. You must have the true love for God and the true love for your neighbor in order to have a true faith. They had considered to the ways of the world. They had succumbed to the deceitfulness of money. They have forgotten their first love for God and 
run away from their true faith. Sadis was famous for business. We are told that dyed clothes, red dyes, were found in Sadis. Good clothes, wool, gold, and other precious things were traded in the city of Sardis. The city of Sardis was very wealthy. Apart from the wealth, it was a worshipping city. But they did not worship the true God. They had their own temples and their gods and goddesses and they sacrificed to these. And sexual immorality was part of their worship to their gods. It was the way they expressed they expressed their worship to their God. The other thing that happened in this city is that according to history, this city did not experience persecution like other cities like Thyatira. Because, because when we read further in, in the book of Revelation, we, we read about the, 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 the city of Thyatira and the, it tells us that they are undergoing persecution but should stick on the Lord. But the city of, service, of Sardis was devoid of persecution. It lived in so much peace that they became complacent. We are also told, told that it was very well fortified. It was well, well fortified and was by the sea. And no one could enter there. So because of that, because of this confidence in their walls and what was there and what they had, the stronghold they had around them, they actually did not have a very active army. And their gates were not guarded. But we are told in the year 547 BC and in the year 214 BC, somehow their enemies found out how they, they used to go in and out. They discovered a secret route on one, of the, on one side of the wall, and the enemies took advantage of that. And because the city was not guarded, the city was routed and destroyed two, those two times. They never learned from the first attack. They had an, another attack. Why? Because they put down their guard. They thought, we are safe, we are secure. We have our money, we have our goodies, and therefore we can enjoy our, our, our life in this place. So the church in, in Sardis fell prey to the laxity of the city. Too much easy money. The book I read says they had, they had access to easy money. I don't know whether they had money like, like money will come when we get oil. We shall get easy money when oil comes. <laughs> but right now, every Ugandan works for hard money. Those who want easy money are credited, as, are, are, are credited as thieves and robbers. But everyone who gets real money in Uganda must actually work for, this, for it. But the city of Sardis had easy money. You would have thought that people who had good security and had an easy life would have turned to the Lord in thankfulness for the good things he has done for them. But instead, the people of, of Sardis spend their money on immorality. They had so much that they forgot the Lord their God, the Christ who called them to be a church. And he is saying, recover your reputation as a living church. Come back to the true faith. Guard that reputation of being alive so that people know that you are a Christian and you are indeed a Christian standing out. A Christian who has pledged allegiance to the Lord even to the, to the point of death. Just like the martyrs and saints that went before us have stood the faith, the stand of the, 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 test, of the, uh, uh, the test of their faith over, over time. He is saying, come back and stand on your feet. Yes, there is something still small in you. Please guard it and grow it. He's calling them to be a living church. I was taught when I was in primary three in the science class that there are certain 
characteristics that distinguish a living thing from a dead thing. Any of you who did P3? <laughs> Tell me the characteristics. And at that time, we, call, we used to call it probably characteristics, something of the sort. Okay. Characteristics of a living thing. One, they move. Do all thing, living things move? Are the trees living? Do they move? A retake. <laughs> Dr. William, <laughs> they change in size. And what do you call that? They grow, they grow. Living things grow. And for a, a human being, when we talk about living, uh, what, when we talk about growth, we are not just talking about changing side changing size, as my brother has said, we are also talking about the mental growth. We are talking about growth in relationships with one another. We are talking about growth in being organized, knowing what to do and not what to do. But above, we are talking about our growth in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our relationship with God must grow. So if we are going to be living beings, but also members of the church of Christ, we must grow physically, spiritually, emotionally, re relationally. Uh, that one probably does not, does, not, does not. But in the way we deal with one another, we must grow. In, the, in our judgment, in making decisions, we must grow. Now, first years, you are going to have to make certain decisions. How to use your spare time is a decision you might you, you will want to make. And you need to choose which kind of friends you will hang around with. You will need to choose whether you will spend your time in church on a Sunday morning or whether you will watch a movie on a Sunday morning. I hope that we shall make mature decisions as Christians that we are expected to grow. So living things grow. What else do they do? They die. That is the last stage. You should have gone systematic, systematic. Okay, they certainly will die. Our times and days are numbered. By the way, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me remind my, my elder colleagues, the Amoses and the Williams. When a person... Um, begins to celebrate big, and big, big marriage, marriage anniversaries, 25, 50. When they begin to celebrate Kuhinjira and giving away their daughters and marrying for their sons, when they begin to retire for work, out from work, you are taking step by step by step. You're going down. You're not going up. You are actually... <laughs> <laughs> it's a journey to the last destination. These things are good to celebrate and we should rejoice in them because every moment God gives us here on earth is a gift from him. So if we are going to do a wedding, let us do it. But I'm not warning young people, please don't, don't, you, don't make weddings that will leave you in debt. Enjoy them, but don't be, don't be in debt. Don't be in too much luxury. Enjoy your days of work because the time is coming when you are not going to be working. Enjoy your days as a student because you are not going to remain a student forever. As a young person just finished school and you are working, you, and you are not yet with the responsibility of children and other encompasses, use your days to the optimum, to be of help to other people, to invest in the eternal things, because very soon you will be entangled like the church in Sardis, with so much luxury, probably, or with so much want that you have nothing, you don't have what, what to use, and therefore you resort to stealing. Use your days well. Invest in time with God so that He can give you right direction in the many or few days that remain ahead of you. So, dying is a sure deal for us. Each one of us, that is a sure deal. 
that we that, that and the good thing with dying is that it puts all of us at the same level. Small and great, thin and huge, all of us must die. And at the end of the day, give an accountability to God for what we did with the days that he gave us. Another characteristic, they get hungry. <laughs> I think getting hungry is part of the need to feed our bodies. You are reminding us, sister, thank you. We must have spiritual hunger. We must have the hunger for the ancient words that we shall feed daily on the word of God so that, that, that we might become spiritually satisfied. Another thing they do, they produce, thank you, they multiply. Living things, all living things, actually multiply. They reproduce themselves. They reproduce their kind. That is the order God give, gave, gave, gave to, the, to his creation. That he's no longer creating things with his hand, but not even, no, even with the command of his word alone, but the things that he has given us will multiply themselves. From in, human beings to animals to plants, they reproduce themselves. And as a church, we are supposed to be a self-propagating church. A church that grows itself. A church that multiplies right from our, from, our, from our families that we introduce our children to the faith, but also go out in witness to other people, as we shall be seeing this semester, that we are called to be a church that is a missionary church. A church that participates in evangelism so that the lost world may come to the true faith. How much have you multiplied in your faith? Are you an aroma for Christ going out to become an evangelist through your words and through your works? Another characteristic? They breathe. Thank you. What do you call that? Scientifically. Respiration. Respiration. What is the transpiration? <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> what? Plants, when plants breathe in and out, what gas do they take out? Come on, excellent. Very good class. Thank you. And what do they breathe in? Oxygen. How do Christians breathe? Don't tell me they do. In, out. How do we breathe as Christians? The word of God, that one is food. But we breathe what? How do we breathe? He has told us here, in this passage here, we breathe through repentance. We take out that which is of no use. And that is seen in the Christian's life. And we breathe in the power, we breathe in the Holy Spirit to empower us to be holy, even as the God who calls us is holy. Since when did you breathe as a Christian? When did you last repent? This breathing is supposed to be every moment. We don't get saved and say, we have reached there, we have finished. Breathing is a daily exercise that we must, exercise, that we must do as believers. And so he's calling the church at, 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 at Sardis to return and repent. So, living things will eat and will grow, will feed, they will grow, they will breathe, they will multiply, and they will die at the end of the day. The church in Sardis, when they got all the wealth around them, forgot these principles. It was no longer multiplying itself, people were no longer growing in faith. People were no longer going out in service to others. And they forgot that they were going to die. And the Lord is saying, strengthen that which is still in you. And then when I come, I'll give you a reward. What are we doing in our faith? What is the Lord calling us to? What do we intend to do for the Lord as a ministry? 
This term we are talking about going out in ministry to other people. And it is my prayer that we shall revive our own lives. The reputation of being alive becomes real in our lives. That we are truly fed on the word of God. That we will truly repent as believers. That we will desire to grow and multiply. Bringing many others into the fold of God. And prepare for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he recognizes that which is in you and wants it to grow. And he recognizes those who are still standing and making a promise that they will wear white robes with him in his eternal kingdom. Are you ready to wear your, job, your robe when the Lord Jesus Christ comes? May the Lord bless you.